Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Simply Cyber Live, the YouTube show that brings cybersecurity industry experts on for a deep conversation to understand, you know, what their what their knowledge base is, what they're doing, and really kind of elicit it for us so we can improve ourselves and really expand on ourselves professionally. And today is going to be a banger. We have with us Eric Taylor of Barricade Cyber Solutions. What makes Eric so special is that he is an incredibly seasoned senior digital forensics incident response expert. He lives in the trenches. He welcomes the challenge of dealing with basically some of the toughest cases out there. And today in this video, in this interview, we're going to be stepping through a day in the life of, you know, wakes up, grabs coffee, gets the phone call. The business has been ransomware. We're totally out of business. We're totally offline. Please help us. It's the equivalent of calling 911 when your house is on fire and begging the fire department to come as quickly as possible. There's high energy, high emotions, a lot of anger, a lot of expectations. And we're not even talking about dealing with the threat actors yet, right? That's an entire other piece of the puzzle that we're going to get into with Eric today. So if you want to know what a day in the life is with dealing with ransomware incident response, stay tuned because we're going to get all up in it. Coming up in a second. Hey, Eric, how are you, man? What's going on, man? I'm not sure if I can live up all of the hype you're putting on there. Oh, what no, is- you, you've got it. You've got it. You know what's going on. Yeah, so... Um, And welcome to all of those coming from Jax's stream on Outpost Gray. We welcome uh, that audience over here. I'm sure Jax did a great job today with her stream. We're big, big fans of hers. So, Eric, and and by the way, chat, you know the routine. Feel free to drop questions in. We'll be throwing them in, throwing them at at Eric. But I really want to chronologically take this show through your day. So let's just pick it, uh, Eric. It's, it's, well, first of all, Eric, give people a little bit of background so we can set the stage on why what you're about to say is so accurate and so relevant. Well, I mean, when we get brought into any sort of case, everybody's world is upside down, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody feels like, especially a business owner and or maybe the senior level IT folks, they feel like they've been personally attacked because like, of a personal assault to them. So I want to go through and just really showcase what it's like to go through this thing so yeah but but yeah. eric how, how many how many ransomware incidents have you worked like like this year what, or I, total 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 yeah uh we're just under three thousand. wow okay so you've got some time in the saddle what what are some of the threat actors that you've dealt with any that we might know uh, we've dealt with conti we dealt with three evil black hat um a, a ton of the no name ones there's a lot of uh, threat actors and ransomware groups that fly under the radar. They don't have the public name and shame sites. So they w- operate off of, you know, AOL accounts and pronto mail accounts, things of that nature. Wow. Okay. Okay. Jesus. So, all right. So we definitely have the right man for the job. I don't know why you're downplaying yourself as, is not living up to the hype. So let's just say, Eric, that it's 8 a.m. You just you you're watching the daily cyber threat briefing on Simply Cyber. You're feeling good. It finishes. You go get a second cup of coffee and you get the phone call. It's it's a manufacturing company mid-size somewhere in Iowa. And they're like, Are you Eric with Barricade Cyber Solutions? Yes, I am. Well, we are dealing with an issue. Well, describe it to me. And they tell you, they explain this. This is what they're looking at. Now, this is the wanna cry ransom note, yep. but 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 any ransom note, right? So is it is it is it a safe indication that the first the first time, the first impact, the first piece that is visible to the victim is some type of ransom note like this? Typically, sometimes a lot of networks will actually go through a, a performance degradation. So they will start seeing, you know, for some reason, you know, their AD users are not being able to log in correctly or they're getting improper timeouts um, or delayed timeouts, things of that nature. Maybe SQL uh, databases are not performing for their applications as expected. So typically for about a day or two, um, depending on how big your network is, how much data there is and the 
the actual threat actor themselves because some ransomware variants do operate in a much higher speed and capacity than other ones do but you typically see a degradation in your performance of your network um a lot of times it was like yeah we you know we were seeing something going on we just couldn't put our finger on it and then you know later that night the next day um you know everything just you know was just hosed everything we got this message everywhere type thing so who's who is the person calling you like who's on the other end of the phone from you is it an executive is it ciso is it some poor schlub who's like the first guy on the scene it, it depends on the the business itself but yeah it's typically the senior level of any organization so uh you know, the smaller businesses do seem to um definitely call from the owner um mm -hmm. you know anybody under 25 users because they don't really have most of those don't have an internal it folks they may have had an outsourced msp so if it's not the um the actual owner doing this then typically it's you know their msp that's calling out and um you know and that's that whole MSP conversation is a different. That's an ugly conversation a lot of times, but it's. Well, I mean, well, let's get into that. Why? Why is it so bad? I mean, is it because you're working through the MSP and trying to help them help their client? Well, a lot of MSPs will actually think that we're going to go in and just start wagging our finger like you son of a, you know, and all that. And we're not really there for that. You know, that's not our core mission. We're not here to name and shame, even though I do a lot of that on my podcast. And I call a spade for a spade pretty brutally of the way it is, just the way I'm built. But, you know, when we're working an incident, we're not here. And a lot of times what you name, you know, Carl, we're not here to, you know, beat down on Carl uh, for doing all the crazy stuff that he does. But, mm -hmm. you know, so they think that we're already an, an inside threat or we're a threat to their relationship with the business. We're like we're not there because we, we're not even going to sign our agreement. Our NDAs and everything like that are with the business itself. And mm -hmm. they give us a, um, a letter through email a notification that we are able to talk to the MSP as part of that NDA. Um, or if it's through legal counsel, they get brought into the attorney client privilege, which is another conversation we can talk about a little bit, but mm -hmm. our main focus is that customer the person that who's down that's that's our goal to figure out what's going on how did it happen and mm -hmm. how quickly can we get them back up so well let's get back to the phone call what's the attitude what's the emotion of the person speaking to you it is literally their worst day of their life for the most part it really is like i said before they really feel like they have been personally attacked um they adrenaline is so high Mm -hmm. You know, mo most of our ransomware cases, once you have signed on with us, you literally have access to one of my two numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So they're calling, they're texting, things of that nature. Um, so those first two days, it's, it's bad, you know, and we feel for them, right? That's, like I said, they, they are personally attacked. They don't know what to do. Their business is down. Mm -hmm. They're literally losing money. They don't know what, whether to send their employees home. They don't know what their next steps are. There's so much going on. So literally our for if I can segue a little bit. So literally mm -hmm. in our in our introduction conversations, we're asking a couple of questions. Do you know who the threat actor is? Mm -hmm. You know, is there a note or whatever? Some some of them do post a note. Hey, it's us again. We're Conti. Ha ha. MF -er. Um some of them don't, you know, some of them have a tour link. Some of them have, you know, like I said, email addresses, you know, we ask, have you reached out to the threat actor at all? Um, mm -hmm. cause we got to gauge where that communication is. Um, and do, do you have a cybersecurity policy? That's literally the three questions I got to ask. And the reason I ask insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So insurance policies are very, very tricky. And this is really why I really, really urge companies who go against a breach to contact an IR firm first, right? When you think about, and I, you and I have talked to us about this uh, several times, I think publicly, definitely privately we have, but uh, when you, let's take your vehicle, for instance, you know, if you had an accident, are you going to let your insurance company themselves go and bang out that fender? Or are you going to use a third party 
to actually do that, like glass repair, right? You can literally go through your insurance carrier and they would do that. Or you can go like if you're in Charleston, you can go down to Glass Pro. There was always a commercial about that, right? So you can mm -hmm. go to your independent one and they'll submit the insurance claims and things of that nature. Same thing with an IR firm. There's a thing called a panel, which is a list of approved vendors that are allowed to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, most of the time, incidents happen on the weekend, right? You know, they are sitting in your network. They're, they started getting in around Wednesday or Thursday. They're waiting till the weekend, especially holidays. And mm -hmm. then they got the, more time to deploy their ransomware load. And then they can, you know, by the time it comes back around or they're remoting in on the weekend or whatever, and they're starting to see this ransomware note. So contacting an IR firm first. So that way we can lay out this groundwork for you of what your next steps are, because we know this industry, we know what to do. We can say, okay, barricade site, you have a, a you have on your insurance cyber cybersecurity insurance policy, you have a panel with these listed people that are approved to do an incident response case. Now we may barricade cyber may not be on that policy. It may be mm -hmm. a crawl. It may be a Mandiant. It may be, um, any one of those other ones that we work with, right? So we have connections with them. So we literally can pick up the phone and be like, hey, blah, 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 at Kroll. Hey, blah, 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 at Mandia. We, I got a referral for you. And then literally we can have them on a big, massive Teams call within two hours. Mm -hmm. So even that handoff to a approved third-party uh, DFIR firm literally happens in real time, as close as real time as possible, right? So we do have do that handoff. Some policies actually allow third parties that are not part of the, the panel to either a at least go in and start containment and maybe do starting negotiations with the ransomware group mm -hmm. on the weekend so at least some progress is done until the insurance companies come up we do see that more and more with a lot of third parties uh or a lot of uh the cybersecurity insurance policies that will allow a third party to come in and get the um with the hit the ground with our feet running and, you know, come in like a SWAT team and boom, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. And, you know, that's kind of how it goes, but definitely you don't want to wait for your insurance company, you know, because you, you'll put them on notice, you'll follow a claim, put them on notice, your insurance company on notice that you're following a claim against your cybersecurity insurance policy. And then, you know, they get their people in or whatever, but if you already have an IR firm that already has, you know, if you're, Policy so covers breach attorney, uh, breach attorneys. We have breach attorneys. We can make that referral, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if we need to start doing, you know, like I said, collections of data. We need to start doing the forensics. All that stuff is laid out in there, so we can advise you. You mm -hmm. know, we may not know exact numbers of, oh, well, your policy will cover seventy-five thousand dollars of DFIR costs or whatever the case is, but we have a pretty good understanding of where you need to go right so yeah and i would imagine so i mean i guess there's two key points here for people one and i know it sounds boring when you talk about cyber insurance but when you're laying out like when you're getting that policy make sure that you you're understanding what happens when when an incident happens and you do need to contact an ir firm because i have seen policies where it'll violate the policy like if they call if you call someone who's not on the panel uh it violates the policy because you know, mm -hmm. this company, this third party hack could have came in and, and messed up everything. And now we can't recover because you deleted everything. Um, so so that's one good point. And then two is, um, you know, be mindful of, of how, how much money there is and stuff like that. You, you definitely want to uh, try to work within the budget, which is why you really should contact a, a ransomware incident response company like Barricade or, or like any other, you know, company that does Barricade's work. Um, in advance, like you should lay all these things out and kind of like, if you really want to go for the shoot for the moon, walk through a tabletop of like what this actually looks like, uh, what we're doing. And just so everybody knows, I do see your questions coming in. You guys have banging questions. We're going to get into all of them with Eric. Um, you did, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, Ripley, my, my dog here. So, uh, I see some people asking about Ripley. Um, so, uh, Eric, I want to go back because I really want to take this chronologically. Uh, you've given a nice, you know, overview. A couple people messaged in here, so I'm not going to say everybody's, but I'll, I'll bring them up. Uh, but the question is, 
you know, Nick Barker and James Driscoll ask, what percentage is job is reassurance versus actual technical? And um, what, there was a, another one in here about, I don't, I don't know where it is, but basically like how much of your job is like pacifying the victim versus, you know, solving the technical problem or like, try, like, so you're on the phone call. How much is like, Hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to take care of you. Like getting them under control versus like, do you guys have logs? What EDR are you running? Do you have technical staff? Who's your MSP POC? Like what's the balance there? Yeah. The first couple of calls, um, is especially the first call. Once we do sign that, we do have an introductory call. We try to, you know, figure out all that stuff. So we know forensically what data that we do need to get. But after that first introductory call, you got to remember these companies don't know me from Adam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't know my team from Adam. So there is that moment that, or that time buffer where they've got to see us being responsive to them for them to earn our, or for us to earn their trust. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, you take the factor of them being panicked, their business is going down, they, they got employees standing around with their thumb up their butts, you know, all these different things. Um, plus, they're just getting ready to, you know, start writing quote unquote blank checks. So tensions are freaking through the roof. You know, we've had, you know, not to, I'm not going to name anybody, but we've had very recently within the past couple of months, people talking about feeling like they're almost having a heart attack. Mm. And we literally got to sit with them. It's like, okay, you know, I don't want to say I'm a psychologist by any means. That's, you know, a licensed trade, but I, a lot of times I feel like we are psychologists. We play that role, if you will, that we are talking them through this. We're saying, yes, we see this. Yes. We don't see that. Yes. We understand, you know, most of the time we are doing things remote, but because tensions and stress are so high, there mm -hmm. are occasions that we have to fly in. And, you know, a lot of them are more senior in age mm -hmm. that they do have that mentality that, you know, we can sit on the Zoom call and you can see me face to face, but there, it's a different, it, they feel differently when they actually see my fat behind sitting in their, their building, <laughs> working and doing this stuff, you know, we're yeah. bringing in Adam, we're bringing in John, we're bringing all these other people, you know, you have two or three people, you know, in their office that it's a different, I guess, relief a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, and you know, that also puts more stress on us a little bit, but you know, um, it's, we, again, yeah. I can talk, well, I can I talk mean, for days with my ADHD, right? <laughs> no, no. But I mean, I can see the reassurance, like, you know, you, you, you just want something to make it feel better and see mm -hmm. like being able to physically look out your office and see somebody doing something that helps fix the problem is reassuring. Um, interesting question to flip it on its head. Jax asks, how do you deal with the stress? I mean, it's, it's very stressful environment. Obviously they're upset. I mean, you're calming them down, but you know, what about you as the practitioner? I unfortunately have a very ugly nicotine habit. Okay. Yep. And would you, would you say that over time you've gotten more acclimated to it? So it's almost desensitized. Yeah. yeah it you know, anybody who works in technology, we'll, we'll pair this very easily with, you know, people who work in technology. When is the last time you had an end user call you like, hi, how are you? Carl. You know? <laughs> yeah. Nobody really calls overly excited. You're, you take, they're having problems, they're having issues, but you amplify that to, like I said before, where they feel like they're having the worst day of their life. Their world is crashing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, sometimes we get cursed at, sometimes we, you know, but it's not, we're seeing them in their darkest moment, you know, mm -hmm. um, almost like, you know, you kind of think of a paramedic, if you will. Again, I'm not trying to say I'm the same people these folks are, but yep. paramedics see people at their worst moments in their lives, right? So how do they deal with it? You know, granted, we're freaking coffeeed up, you know, we're <laughs> nicotined up, we're, you know, sometimes we just get up and take a walk. Right. So, I mean, but we just can't, we can't stay away for too long. It's not like I can go on a two, two hour hike, you know, I've mm -hmm. got freaking work to do, you know, but you know, we do, we do try to, we don't take it personally. We don't take it to heart. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest thing we got to do is like, look, we are seeing them in the worst moments of their lives. 
this was not a personal attack, even though if they come at us at a personal level, especially, like I said, that's first 48 hours, it's mm -hmm. definitely not a personal attack. Take it for the situation that it is, let it wash over. You know, my military in the Marine Corps is definitely, you know, indicative to show that that gives me, I guess, that um, water off my back type of thing, like a duck mm -hmm. analogy, but, you know, just take it for what so it is. Okay, so you, you get the phone call. Hey, like mid-sized manufacturing company, we're down. I'm flipping out. You calm me down. I feel better. All right. So what what do we need to do? Like I don't I don't need you to physically come here, Eric. I just if you can do it remotely, do it remotely. Um what what do you need from me, Eric? What what's what's the next step? Next step is literally getting access to your network. So we will get in through one of our applications like Splashtop or TeamViewer, where we typically use Splashtop because it typically does work better in a ransomware network because Splashtop will actually beacon out over IP versus DNS. Um, TeamViewer has a lot of issues with that. So we typically do that. We get into the GPO. We try to deploy our Hold, hold on. Stop for a second. What do you... Uh what are you remoting into? Are you remoting into a domain controller? Are you remoting into a, an endpoint that they set up and then jump boxing into the domain controller? It depends on the situation. Typically, we will go straight into the domain. Okay. Um, okay. We'll try to see if we can get that loaded, see if group policy is working, because we want to try to deploy. We use CrowdStrike. Um, there's Because for our DFR, IR, we're able to collect a ton of logs through the back end of it. Um, so if we can get the GPO to work so that way we can be able to massively deploy CrowdStrike, you know, where we're coming in like a SWAT team, if you will, to start collecting that forensics as fast as possible, because we're really against a race for a business. You know, we figure out, well, I guess let's take a, a step back. So it really depends on the scope that the company wants us to bring us in. You know, we can just do negotiations, right? Um, and that negotiation path is a beast all by its own. So, you know, we can broker a communication with the hackers. We do the negotiations. They say, okay, they started off at a hundred thousand. We've talked them down to 25,000 over the course of a couple of days. They say, okay, we're, we want you to send it to this wallet. Now, as part of that negotiations, we have to go against the IRS OFAC list to make sure that they are not on a sanction list with that wallet. And that threat actor is not sanctioned on that wallet as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can be able to broker and handle that community, that, um, that transaction to help them get their decryption keys and do that. So that's phase one, that's part one that runs unilaterally with everything else that we do. Um, step two is really the, the, uh, digital forensics and the digital forensics and containment. If they want us to do that, then that's when we start coming in with our CrowdStrike. We start pulling all of our logs. If we're seeing, workstations servers other network devices that are starting to beacon out and there's still data exfiltration still going on we're able to immediately shut it down we're able to do a lot of that mitigation and do that containment which is what most companies want us to do uh little buddy i see you i'll talk to you later about that i can't deal with uh that's restream little buddy but anyway um sorry guys my little guys in there in the chat but anyway yeah, um hooking it up wants to get you get you the likes get you the clicks i love it yeah. <laughs> but yeah um so most most partner or most clients come in they just um they, they just they don't want to pay the ransom which i completely understand right um yeah. Yeah. actually that's a great question how often do you see like you know in your experience like let's say in the last six months because it's a very temporal thing in the last six months, what's kind of the rough percentages of businesses wanting to pay the ransom versus not wanting to pay the ransom? Almost 100% don't want to pay the ransom, but 90% end up having to because of... <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's an interesting way to caveat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants to pay, right? And who wants to spend money on something like that? You know, there's no yeah. tangible result that you can hold in your hand, right? But... Um, you know, because it's like the same mentality of someone broke in your house and stole your TV. Now you're going to pay the guy to come back in and put amount the TV back on your wall again? Not really. But yeah, so yeah. a lot of times they don't have good or adequate backups, things of that nature. And the other side of the coin is if there was data exfiltrated out of there, depending on what business it is, you may need to pay that ransomware no to keep from that double extortion from that name and shame site actually publishing your data on the dark web because i mean even though a lot we hear about ransomware all the time 
and a lot of the big major threat actors do name do their name and shape and they do publicly put that data out there you know i don't think a lot of competition is actually going to the dark web so like if you're you know a man like we said in manufacturing we're making bobs and widgets you know um mm -hmm. I don't think the Jetsons in the future are going to the dark web and pulling that stuff for, you know, Bob Sprockets, right. And being yeah. in competition, you're inside a threat, but a lot of that stuff is, could be sensitive information, right? So, you know, what if all of your employees, social security numbers and, um, your, uh, healthcare, uh, enrollment forms and stuff like that was part of that data exfiltration in your manufacturing company. It can be very sensitive, right? And that's really where it goes back to having that breach notification attorney at the start to really help you guide those waters as a business is really, really crucial. Absolutely. Uh, so I do want to say, Chad, I see all your questions. Poner Joe's got a question. A lot of people uh, are seconding it and wanting uh, to see it. It's about an IR career. So I want to keep on with the ransomware stuff, but I will. we will bring that question up and answer it in this stream. I just want to, I just want to keep going. Uh, around this kind of day in the life. So you you get on, you get a, a, uh, into the DC. Do they give you a domain admin account? Most of the time, the domain doesn't even work. So we just work under the existing administrator, right? So the network's already hosed. So we're just going to use the existing credentials. So we literally, once we actually, we actually have an Excel spreadsheet that we actually build a timeline on. Mm -hmm. um, and then we are actually working back. So like say today at, you know, 16, uh, 1600 hours, we put that in, we got access into the network. So anything from that moment that we are seeing in the logs after it's because of us, everything mm -hmm. before is either because of internal or the threat actor. Interesting. So how, how much of your work you said, okay, so you said that you get called in and sometimes you're just doing negotiations. I mean, is it basically um, whether or not the network is completely not hosed, but like if all the endpoints are already ransomware, like it's a fast moving, uh, I forget it's Loki bot. That's like the fastest one right now, isn't it? Yeah, I think um, there's another. I think Black Hat actually started adopting the Rust one as well. Yeah. Um, so, so is that the decision point? Is like, listen, this thing's already done executing. There's no point uh, in in dropping uh, um, CrowdStrike and in, in, in doing this, or are you going to do that no matter what? And and or. I guess what my question is, do they bring you in and say, hey, we just want you to do negotiations or do you come on site, evaluate the situation with some criteria and say the only thing left to do is negotiate with them? Yeah, it really depends on the business, right, and their current mindset. So, I mean, I can't twist anybody's arm and say, oh, we must do forensics. You know, there are a lot of companies that will say it doesn't freaking matter. They're already in. They're already ransomware. Um, I don't care how they got in, but... Mm -hmm you know, we just need to fix this. So okay. yeah, they're not interested in that. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so Nick's got a question along these lines. Mm -hmm. Are the steps to contain and analyze the network basically the same? Or does it depend on what the attack vector was? Well, it does depend on the attack vector, right? So a, a lot of ransomware groups use different TTPs. Um, you know, some most of them use a lot. You know, they will typically use, you know, R open RDP. They use open uh, vulnerable SSH, uh, vulnerable IPsec, uh, mal or phishing emails are typically the the major ones that we do see. But um, we do that's typically the base. So when we go in and, you know, if it's, let's we'll just say Phobos, that's one of the recent ones that we had. You know, we already know from the start, just from all the experience that we've had, plus talking with other DFIR firms, you know, we already know, okay, Phobos is a ransomware as a service. You know, they are very, um, they're very active. They're very widespread, like m most of the major ones, but there's no, um, there's no notes of data exfiltration. There's no name or shame site. They're not going to steal and leak off your data. So, you know, it's like, okay, do we really want to do forensics when we already kind of know what the TTPs for Phobos are? Mm -hmm. Not really, right? I mean, if I go in and I take a look at your sonic wall and it hasn't been patched in a couple of years, I'm pretty much sure that your sonic wall is your point of entry. You know, we'll double mm -hmm. check and see if there was RDP, things of that nature, you know, um, but a lot of them do have telltale TTPs. Um, Every once in a while, we do get some of the new ones that come in um, that, you know, we do, we want to 
do the forensics because we want that insight. But uh, again, we can't strong arm the potential client. So it, it really depends on the threat actor to answer the question. All right. So Adrian, following up on that, Adrian asks a question about, you know, what, what was the entry point for, you know, that's mostly used for the attack vector by the threat actors. Like you, you've mentioned a couple different ones could be vulnerable VPN, could be leaked creds, whatever. Are you seeing any kind of trend data? No, I mean, that's typically it. Um, you know, like I said, RDP, AKA ransomware deployment protocol. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's great. That should be a sticker or a t-shirt, man. I like that. Yeah. Um, that I think RDP is probably the number one vector. Um, the SSLs, uh, the, the, the VPNs, whether it's SSL or IPsec, you know, mm -hmm. SonicWall and a couple of the uh, other manufacturers have had a lot of problems in the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, email phishing, um, you know, with, yeah, there was one, I forget, his name is escaping me, but there's a, a group out there right now that is pushing out an ISO image as part of an attachment that will come in so that it bypasses all of your freaking filtering because it's an yeah. ISO image. And so they extract, you know, it mounts as a drive and they open it up and it's a freaking malicious payload. So um, I know. We covered that in the, uh, the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing just recently. I I'm going to see if I can pull it up. Yeah, the, um, the threat actor is escaping me at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's, it was, um, I don't have it up here right now. Yeah, it's, it's one of the, it is one of the more notable ones, um, I believe. Maybe, I don't know. Anyways, yeah. Anyways, that, that is a clever way to do it. And it's interesting because usually ISO files are so huge that they don't, that, that that's the, the thing that gets them filtered out is because you can't email like a 300 meg file or something like that, but it's basically a tiny little ISO, right? Yeah. It's typically on, you know, under a couple of megs. Right. So, yeah. and what spam filtering program out there is actually going to take every ISO image that comes through and actually mount it internally to see what's inside of there. Oh, that's I don't know. I, I, I don't know any of them that do that. That is interesting, though. That's almost like USB auto loading, um, you know, as a, as a comp. Yeah. Um, so, OK, so another question to kind of like, you know, follow this path. Joe Belton asks, you know, do, do you find that most ransomware is pretty routine? Like you've seen 3000 instances and I know, you know, some of them painted purple. Some of them, you know, have a different you know, notepad ransom note versus a cool Web3 ransom note. But is it pretty routine? Like you just like, you've got a, a routine that you execute on. Yeah. I mean, depending on the threat actor, we, we pretty much know, like I said, what the TTPs are, the, uh, um, what their motto is of how they execute their things. Um, but with that said, you know, a lot of these ransomware groups are ransomware as a service or RAS, um, mm -hmm. RASS. So we, we still have to make sure especially in the, our industry that we just, we're not going through the motions, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a case last year for Phobos that I think uh, one of the subcontractors, if you will, uh, they were actually trying to upload to Carbonite, which is not vindicative of that ransomware group. You know, they just get in, they spread their one dot bat file across the network, they encrypt, they get out as quick as possible, right? So mm -hmm. for them to actually, you know, actually go through and start installing Carbonite so that way they can start backing it up before they, you know, encrypt was really, really weird. I'd never seen that before out of that threat group. And do you think that that's a modification or do you think it was a different actor behind the keyboard? It was a different actor because like I said, Phobos is definitely a ransomware as a service. So, you know, if you think, you know, most of these ransomware as a service, you know, you got your corporate identity here, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then you got a bunch of minion workers that are going out there and actually breaching everything, you know, um, and they just report back to the corporate. Hey, I just popped ABC liquor company over here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now give me like if you go back and look at the Conti, you know, the the Conti leaks, they actually breached into a network. Then they communicate with corporate. Uh, that, hey, we've got this now, give me a payload 
that way I can deploy on there. They didn't ever give it ahead of time. It was only after you breached in there can provide enough information and proof that you got inside of their network. That's why a lot of times you'll see them actually taking screenshots before a ransomware payload is actually done. Yeah, it's interesting to be that big. Um, where like, you know, it's like anything else, the bigger the business, the more process and, and steps that need to happen. Um, and it, it doesn't, you know, cyber criminal enterprises really are businesses and some of the bigger ones like Conti, for example, I mean, they, they have that, those workflows that just, you know, it takes some time. Of course, I mean, at the end of the day, they're trying to make sure that their payload hits and that they get the maximum value for their, for their investment. It's so weird to talk about it. Like they're a, a legit yeah, it's so it's so screwed up that, you know, they actually consider the victim a fucking client. I'm like, no, yeah. you're a hacker. Shut up. Yeah, it, it is. It is pretty gross. Um, okay. So, so let, let me, let, let, let's kind of expedite through the day in the life. Cause there's a lot of great questions we can pick and choose as we go. But so you, um, you, you stem the bleeding, right? You said that if you see data X filled, you'll stop that. So you stem the bleeding you talk to the uh, threat actors and you negotiate, like say some value. Now let, let's do a fork in the road. If mm -hmm. the victim is going to restore from backups, right? So, Hey, we're not going to pay end of story. We're going to restore from backups. Do, do you, is barricade put on, on the bench or, Hey, we'll contact you if we need you. Or do you stay with them? Because obviously the recovery process is not always flawless. So, what does that look like when the when the victim says we're going to restore from backups? We spent a lot of money on you know whatever solution we're going to restore from backups. What what happens to you in that case? We're typically brought on or retained on through that process. Um, it depends on their backup software that they're using. There's a lot of backup tools out there that only do file and folder. Mm -hmm. So you know they're only backing up their QuickBooks. They're only backing up. Um, you know, they're my pictures and documents, but for some reason, you know, your your buddy Carl was full, saving a bunch of data in unknown folders in the root folder of C. Uh, we do see that a lot of times in the workstations, um, maybe folder redirection wasn't properly working, things of that nature. Um, but the one message that needs to be driven home, even if you restore from backups, a lot of times these, like I said, these threat actors are sitting inside of your network for about you know, two or three days, maybe even a couple uh, weeks to a couple months, depending on, you know, the actual threat actor that's in there. Um, so could they, there be still persistence? Like say, if you got popped today, but the threat actor was there from, you know, let's just say the first of the month, but you're restoring from last week. Some yeah. of the, some of their persistence may still be in there. So you restore from your backup and boom, that persistent fires back up that threat actor is back into your network again and still doing, you know, they just re-encrypted you again. You're back at zero, you know, day zero again. So that, that's gotta be one of the most infuriating things as a victim. Cause you must feel like, Oh, we're so close to recovery. Like I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and we'll be back, but this nightmare behind us. And then you, you get the same ransom note and you're like, Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we wow. definitely stay deployed. Um, Typically, our engagements will stay 60 days after uh, the network has been stabilized. Mm -hmm. But nine times out of 10, they got to rebuild their network. We, You can never trust a network that's been popped. So network rebuild, is, it's going to have to happen. So just because you recovered from the uh, ransomware, you're going to see your servers are never going to act the same way twice. Unless you had full disk images like... You're doing full snapshots of your hyper VMs or your uh, VMware VMs, and you're restoring those type of things. And you know that those devices are clean. Mm -hmm. Typically, you're okay, but you know, I just never trust a box that's been popped. I see too many problems, too many things that are, you know, just lingering weird issues that persist mm -hmm. after it. You just got to do it. So, yeah. So, you know, Nick's asking who does the network rebuild? I mean, obviously that's not your job. I mean, we can like, be, it can be, Dude, mm -hmm. I mean, I have to imagine that victims are very reluctant to want to do a network rebuild just because of the time and the financial burden that that is. I, I'm sure that they try to slog on with what they've got and, yeah. and only after realizing after a month that it's a hot mess express that they need to rebuild. Yeah. Gosh, so typically that, after, you know, things, the typical way things go, especially if you don't have, 
a ransom or if you don't um, have adequate backups or your backwards were deleted or, you know, encrypted mm -hmm. themselves, um, you know, we'll keep our solution in place and we'll work with them to build, start building up a new domain and start pathing or put, putting that all together. So that way we can start doing a migration, you know, smaller companies under a hundred devices can be done in a week or two weeks, depending on how complex it is. You know, do they have some legacy line of business applications that could cause a lot, a lot of problems, right? Cause we've had several manufacturing companies that have custom LOBs line of business, um, mm -hmm. apps that are, you know, the developers aren't around anymore. Right. So, oh, oh yeah. Like you just pushing my button right now about legacy systems and custom builds and it's just a prototype and it's just a band aid until we can get the, uh, the, the budget for next fiscal year. And then it becomes mm -hmm. a friggin' permanent addition to the, to the enterprise. I hate that, man. Yeah. So, so what about, okay. So it's back, like the you wall never on your back that you want to have laser removed, but just never do. <laughs> so you have, um, let's say they, they, they didn't invest in cyber. They have no backups and they're like, all right, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna pay. So let's say, you know, you do your negotiations as you would, they get some number, What's that look like? Are are you helping them send the money to the wallet? Are you getting the decryption key? Like what what's that experience look like? Yeah, so we do we do have uh, private wallets that we use, um, mm -hmm. just because you can't use a public exchange. Um, I mean, granted, we all of our stuff goes through a public exchange and it comes over to our private wallets, but you know we have money sitting in our private wallets. You know, just because it's on YouTube, I don't want to say too much about that and be a special yep. threat. But yeah, um, you know, we always have a a fun we have funds sitting in private wallets to broker that ransomware payment because a lot of times those things do um need to have you know those payments expedited over the weekends and you know you're not gonna be able to do a wire transfer to coin hub or any of the other um public brokers during the weekend to make that ransomware payment so we definitely keep that on hand so i mean is it is it is it as easy as Here's, I mean, is it really just a simple transaction? Like you're buying a, you know, a used iPod on Craigslist. Like here's the money, they prove it, and then what do you get? Like an email with the decryption key? Do you get a link to a download? What's it look like? Yeah, it depends on the threat actor. Some of them are completely automated, like the ones that we spoke about with the name and shame sites. Um, some of them are completely automated. So as soon as they're monitoring that Bitcoin or Monero or whatever currency that they want address it will actually pop up that download link and hmm. you can be able to download it from their, their portal, you know, just like you're buying Adobe standard PDF or uh, Adobe cloud, right? You bought it. Now you can download your software, so to speak. Um, some of the other threat actors you're working by email, they, you know, they'll email it back to you. It kind of goes through a whole freaking <laughs> process. Right. So it's just automation. Like I just like a source solution for ransomware <laughs> payment and decryption keys. Yeah. Uh, simple, single pane of glass for the threat. Yeah, actor. so it really depends on the threat actor. You know, like I said, some of it is really an automated process. I mean, most of the the one thing that does take a little bit is, um, you know, when you send off, especially we'll use Bitcoin because that's pretty much everybody knows Bitcoin for the most part. But mm -hmm. there's a number you got to wait for ten, what's called ten cycles of the wallet transactions to cycle through, which could take about two hours. Um, so you sent it, they can see, okay, the money's been sent, but you got to wait for it to fully complete, you know, and all of the validators have approved that, yes, this payment is on that blockchain, and then they'll give it to you. So it's not like you went to Best Buy or Radio Shack, well, Radio Shack isn't around, but you went to your local grocery store and you're buying some apples, you know, it's not like you got to wait for your credit card processor to fully pull out that money from your account and wait for that pending transaction to clear. That's the best way that I can explain it. Right. You're able to yeah. walk out, but with it's almost like, it's almost like right, writing a check and then waiting for it to clear at the bank before they send you the decryption key. Yep. So, okay. So you get the decryption key. Now this percentage has changed over time. Uh, I feel like it's actually gotten higher because threat actors want to continue to have good reputation. But what, what's the percentage on the decryption key successfully working? It's actually pretty good. There's been some cases that we've had, especially this year, where the 
the payload was running and it was encrypting the files and then their tool was starting to catch it. So, but it was catching it middle stream. Mm -hmm. So it never fully encrypted that file. Therefore it can't be fully decrypted either. Ooh. So, so is that, is that really the instance when we like, we hear all the time about like, Oh, the decryption key didn't work. And I always thought it was like an F you from the attacker saying like, like, oh, I, 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 I encrypted, you know, uh, ABC liquor store and green manufacturing. And, you know, the keys just got messed up because it's automated and crap happens sometimes. And I sent the wrong key to the wrong person. But what do I care? I already got paid. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was it. You're saying typically when we hear that the decryption key did not work, it's more because the encryption process got bollocksed? Yep. Interesting. And that's really, I mean, whatever. It's not, <laughs> it's messed up because it's like the attacker can't be like, you know, sorry, like it's, it is the correct uh, decryption key. Yeah. Um, Cause all the rest of your files got decrypted, but this list of, these lists of files did, couldn't get decrypted, you know, and you, you know, try to play nice and everything, but cause some of them may be a QuickBooks database file. You mm -hmm. really, really need that file back. Um, so, you know, you would send it off and, you know, you, you freaking sweat bullets until they send it back to you because like you just sent them, you know, an encrypted QuickBooks database file and you're like, oh, son of a bitch. Now, now they've got that data and they're going to send it back and they, they'll they have the complete financial. Yeah, that's so messed it. up. You're, you're like literally sending your most sensitive information intentionally to the threat actors. Yeah. So, I mean, they could literally oh. be like, oh, we just opened up your QuickBooks database file and seen you, you made, netted $3 million last year. If you want this file back, you know, we need another payment. And that does happen a lot where they'll come back and say, oh, you want more help from us and it's going to cost more. Oh my God. I'm like, like, I, I'm not even a victim right now. And I'm, I'm getting just nauseous about thinking about sending, you know, my most sensitive business data to a threat actor. Like that it's so inverted from like, what is comfortable and what is normal. Uh, I do want to point out really quick. I'm, I'm well aware of everybody in chat who's pointing out that Eric whipped my butt in red versus blue <laughs> yesterday. Uh, a lot of people talking about how you're, you come on streams like this to, to, um, uh, to relax after a hard day of ransomware. If, if you haven't had a chance to relax, whooping my butt. So, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, okay. So let's say they do the decryption key. The decryption key works. They're good to go. Is there anything left for you, or do you just uh, shake shake the person who called you on the phone the first day, shake their hand and say, "Hey, like if you ever need me, call me again." Like what? What's the kind of closeout? It really is twofold. So it's either that, right? It's like, okay, we rebuilt your network and you're good. You know, we're not seeing any new threats. Um, now, either you we can part ways, friends, or if you want to keep us around on a long term engagement, then that's what we do. We we go into an IR retainer platform so they'll mm -hmm. we'll sell we'll sell them crowdstrike pretty much almost at cost you know we're not there to really make money off of that but then they pr procure a block hour arrangement with us um uh, depending on their size of their organization so if anything in the future ever happens then they call they know exactly who to call eric you know barricade cyber somebody at barricade cyber pick up the phone we just we think we've had an incident you know we've we've literally gotten calls at two o'clock in the morning where the owner was remoted back into their, or the the owner was at work, remoted back into his home PC, and all of a sudden starts seeing his mouse move around, and we we got called in. It was like, okay, you're enacting us as you know part of the IR. We're going to you know start acting on this thing. We started digging and digging and digging and digging and digging. You know, we spent like 12, 13 hours. I'm like, we're not seeing a freaking damn thing on this. You know, there's nothing going on and then come to find out you know a couple of days later um this cat jumped up on the freaking laptop and started moving their mouse around i'm like and he's like what i'm like well <laughs> at least you know we respond at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> yeah so uh, a true insider threat feline uh, uh threat actor i like it that's yeah. so funny so so let's pivot a little bit eric we've talked about the day in the life if you will um of the incident responder for the for the ransomware um poner joe asked a question a lot of people jumped all over it you know can you outline a path for someone who wants like who wants to get into this someone who wants to run into the fire 
I will just tell you, you need to have a long, hard conversation with yourself. Is this really what you want to do? You know, granted, you know, you see commercials and, you know, people trying to get you into, you know, their school to become cybersecurity, but you really have to have a passion for this because this business will literally chew you up and spit you out. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to get in, we've done it before. We, we've sponsored um, with uh, Jerry and Simply Cyber. I would strongly recommend taking the GRC course. You know, that gives you a lot of introductory level. Even employees who come to Barricade Cyber that have no certifications are going through Jerry's GRC. You know, I want them to come up with a basic set of knowledge, right? After that, talk with your, um, with your employer. I mean, all of our guys... I'm not sure if it really will come up or not, but all of our guys go through SANS classes. We become, we go through G, uh, GX certification for digital forensics and incident response. We're going through, you know, three of them this year. Um, I got enough books over here. I think I cut down half a forest. Um, but definitely, you know, you're going to want to get to SANS. I firmly believe in SANS. Um, they are expensive, so definitely... Make sure you get with a company that's going to support your education. Yeah. Um, because these classes are about you know anywhere between nine and thirteen thousand dollars. So you know. no, they're definitely not cheap. Sands is the best, but you pay for the best. Yeah. Um, one th one thing that I think a lot of people, especially people who are who are not in the industry or new to the industry, don't know, and I'd love for you to give your thoughts on this. What is the difference between a SOC analyst? And what you do? A, what's the difference between a SOC analyst and a differ engineer? SOC analyst is trying is hopefully looking at the, being a proactive detection. Mm -hmm. You know, SOC should be able to start saying, "Okay, we're starting to see failed login attempts against workstation, uh, front desk workstation. We need to start." In, uh, analyzing this and seeing what the heck's going on. Where is that traffic coming from? DFIR, DFIR, Digital Forensic Incident Response, we come in when, sorry to say this, but when the shit hits the fan, right? Every, your SOC, your SIM, your everything was either not properly configured, not properly monitored, whatever the case is, and it's gone awry, you know? So... You know, whether it's ransomware, which is the big thing, but we do get a lot of cases about PCI, you know, car, potential credit cards are being stolen. Um, we see, you know, internal theft, you know, can we be able to start beaconing back to a remote user who stole a laptop with corporate assets and stuff? So, you know, there's a lot of different things in digital forensics and incident response that go outside of ransomware, but, you know, that's typically what it is, right? So... SOC and your SOC and your NOC network operations center are definitely supposed to be proactive versus we are reactive. Mm -hmm. um, and re real quick, you know, um, I, I appreciate that you, you put it that way, but like the SOC analysts and differ, it really, it really makes me think of the difference between in the NIST cybersecurity framework. I typically think of the first two out of five identify and protect as more GRC functions and detect, respond, recover as more blue team. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying really makes me think that you could almost put SOC analysts in it more in the identify and protect bucket. And yeah. while they do detect, um, it's really incident response differ that is in that right side of kind of the, the life cycle of an incident, uh, of a information security kind of a program. Although SOC analysts, can be generalized and do incident response type work. So that does happen. Um, but I feel like as you get a little bit bigger, as you get a little bit more specialized, you you begin to like refine what that blue team role is, either in digital forensics or incident response, which are not exactly the same, or um, detection engineer, if you're going to be like a SOC analyst on steroids, um, if you will. Uh, Kimberly asked a really great question. What's the longest you've worked on an incident? Mm. seven months what what about at, at, in like <gasps> one one sitting like one button seat yep se seven months so that was a 32 site location that needed to have their entire network rebuilt so we had to go in 
you know, we actually did the forensics, we did the con network containment, things of that nature. Um, and then we helped them through the rebuild process with, uh, they had a, what we call co-manager, they had an internal IT team. So we built corp, we helped them rebuild the corporate, put in new GPO policies, um, helped them adopt zero trust and started redoing all their satellite offices. And it was, mm -hmm. it was a massive undertaking. It, it took a while. So th that one was right about seven, maybe eight months. So that was a pretty good stint. What, what about when you're dealing with a hot, hot incident? I mean, may, maybe this is a fake question because when you're actually dealing with it, you do pace yourself and you do take breaks and you do sleep. Well, what's the longest situation where you've been like at the keyboard, like we're working, if it takes 12 hours, if it takes 24 hours, what what what, what about that kind of micro uh, event? Um, so that micro event, so I, I'll expand this one. I think I know where they're trying to get to. So um we work until it is done, right? I have literally sat at this desk for three days straight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times we do have multiple cases going on at the same time. So, you know, we're hopping between cases, we're hopping between communications with threat actors, we're hopping in between analyzing forensics for different sites at different locations. So, you know, if we got a ton of work going on, we're I'm cranking that. I'm normally the one, of course, that works around the clock, but, you know, being the owner, that's kind of what we do. But, um, yeah, about three days. So I think the other flip side of the coin, which I think is not being asked, but maybe, is we get a lot of times are is from the time of engagement, when can I get some sort of resemblance of a functioning business, right? You know, we come in and we're doing the negotiations, we're doing the containment if need be. And we're making the, the the payments and we're getting the decryption and starting the decryption process. But listen to me. If you're going through a ransomware situation, you need to budget roughly about two weeks of complete crap. Because mm -hmm. it's going to take, you know, the first communications, especially to an email addressed threat actor, that first line of communication between us and them will literally take two to three days. They are not quick to respond. Now, the bigger name and shame sites, they're a little bit more proactive in their communication. But interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, you got to, yeah, I guess you really got to be real that like the threat actor isn't sitting there looking at their computer waiting for a message from you. They're, mm -hmm. they're just, they have a, they have, literally have a customer service team. Mm hmm. So speaking of teams, you know, what's a diff, what's your different team composition? You know, you said you obviously the owner and you work hard, but um, what, what's the team composition? Is it, is it so, I mean, six of you running around or is there, is there skills like an A team kind of thing? So typically, I mean, we are a very small company, so there's only three of us, me and one junior and an admin or no, there's four. So me and one other senior, a junior and an admin assistant that kind of keeps us all straight. So, but ideally, when you're dealing and as we even start, start to grow, you know, you're going to have teams, teams of like three to four people with various specialties. Some of them are going to be, you know, sand strains for event logging. Some teams are going to be highly trained in ma reverse malware analytic analytics because some cases require that, um, you know, it depends on you're going to build certain teams or certain pods built off of, you know, certain trade crafts. Um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what it is. So typically a team of about three to four people per team to handle cases. And as your company grows, you just develop and build up more and more teams to handle those cases. Oh, that's awesome. How many, how many, how many, uh, engagements can you handle concurrently? You said you have a couple engagements going on. I mean, surely there's a threshold that is yeah. un untenable. Well, when we start getting about 13 cases at one time, I get a little squirrely. Oh my God. Uh, that's, I mean, that's good for business, but good grief. That's, that's 13 phone calls of that high energy, high stress exec. Yep. Wow. I guess that's why you have two phones, right? <laughs> yeah. So. so, wow. Okay. Well, we're almost at, at time. I can't believe an hour flew by that quick. People have loved this conversation, Eric. Um, we might have to bring you back on if, if you want to come on and talk about uh, ransomware incident response. Uh, some okay. people called it a, uh, a masterclass, an insider look, a peek behind the curtain on what um, 
on what it is to do ransomware incident response. So I love to do you, do you want to uh, share any kind of final thoughts or uh, direct anyone to anything uh, before we say goodbye? Yeah. So if this stuff has been value, please, of course, like and share this this information. Right. Um, share it with those that you think will get great benefit of this. If you don't know your security posture, literally go to barricadecyber.com. We are very approachable. My calendar, if you just scroll down just a little bit, it's literally right there. Um, you just scroll down, boom, there's my calendar. You know, pick a date and time that works for you. If you have questions, we'll talk. If you want to engage us to actually bring us in beforehand, you want an incident response retainer, you want to bring in somebody who's going to be watching your back in case something goes back, we'll help you out. Like I said, if you just have questions, um, the one thing I would recommend everybody go find your cybersecurity policy, find out mm -hmm. what it is today. That insurance removes. policy, in, insurance policy. Yep. Yep. Find out what it is. You know, well, I'll sign an NDA with you folks and we'll review it. If we can't be on your panel, at least we could partner you with who can be. And at least you're one step up, right? You know who you're calling when it hits the fan. Yeah. And I, you know, Barricade Cyber Solutions is a, uh, a proud sponsor of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing every morning. And it's not just, you know, a sponsorship. It, 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 I really mean it when I say it every morning. If you don't have a group already, if you haven't talked to someone, and hopefully this session has proved it, like you really want to have done that initial conversation and, and, and know who you're talking to and, and really have expectations set for yourself on what the hell is going to happen when you have to pick up the phone and call someone. If you don't know who you're going to call, it's like, it's like, you know, when you need a lawyer, if you don't have a lawyer, like you're like, oh, what do I do? Like just open the phone book? No, like that's dumb. So, um, you know, calling Barricade and having a conversation, at least just to explore it is definitely mm -hmm. a best practice. Um, yeah. So absolutely. So uh, we, dr we dropped a link or I'll drop a link in chat uh, for Barricade Cyber so everybody can grab that and put good time on Eric's calendar um, with your, whoever is in, whoever the boss is or whatever, whoever is responsible for making sure that incident response is going to happen well and well oiled. Um, you can have a, a cool conversation with Eric. I'm sure it's pretty low key and chill as far as like, here's what we do. Here's what you need to do. Um, go from there. So absolutely love it. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this wildly excellent episode of Simply Cyber Live. Special thanks to Eric Taylor of Barricade Cyber Solutions for allowing us to walk through, um, like he said, the worst day of whoever's on the other end of that phone's life. Um, and he deals with that all the time. So amazing stuff, Eric. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for sharing. Chat loved it. Um, you know, all right, guys. And we'll see you uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m. for the daily cyber threat briefing. All right. Take care, everyone. Cheers.